My name's Dan Snow, and I want to tell you about History Hit TV. It's like the Netflix for history. Hundreds of exclusive documentaries and interviews with the world's best historians. We've got an exclusive offer available to fans of Timeline. If you go to History Hit TV, you can either follow the information below this video or just Google History Hit TV and use the code TIMELINE, you get a special introductory offer. Go and check it out. In the meantime, enjoy this video. I thought, I'm looking at a Nazi war criminal. This is incredible. Priebke had been one of the most important Gestapo officers in Rome during the war. From all reports, he had a certain brutality and efficiency about him. This guy is right up there with Mengele, with Eichmann. What I felt in front of that man, it was hate. We were hoping that we could confront a couple of Nazis in a German town in the Andes. I've interviewed a lot of people who have committed crimes, and they usually run when they see someone like me. Argentina. For half a century, a haven for Nazi war criminals. Until now. In a historic move, the government opens its post-war archives to the world. One day in early 1994 at our program Primetime Live, someone said, why don't we do the story of how Nazi war criminals came to Argentina after World War II? The story will lead one of America's most celebrated television news teams to the scoop of a lifetime, to one of the last remaining high-ranking Nazis still at large, SS Captain Eric Priebke. With the greater liberalization of the Argentine administration, the old junta days had gone, new files were emerging which suggested that a lot of Nazis had indeed fled to South America and Argentina. The stories that had been coming out at the time were that the Argentine government had been hiding something. And I thought, okay, well, can I go down there and find the Nazi who's still alive, perhaps? ABC News producer Harry Phillips is assigned the story. I went down to Buenos Aires to poke through archives. I spent hours and hours by myself going through files. And sure enough, I found a lot of Nazis who we knew had traveled to Argentina. Adolf Eichmann, Joseph Mengele. The next task was to determine who was still a war criminal whose name I didn't have who might still be in the file. We knew from the Simon Wiesenthal Center that there was a man in Argentina. He called himself Juan Mahler, but we suspected very strongly that he was a Nazi named Reinhard Kops, who we knew was a Nazi because there were records of him. All I needed to do was confirm that Juan Mahler was Reinhard Kops. Thanks to the Simon Wiesenthal Center, we knew that Juan Mahler was in Bariloche, living in hiding deep in the Andes in this small German town. The Simon Wiesenthal Center is a Jewish human rights organization. What neither they nor ABC know is that Reinhard Kops, AKA Juan Mahler, will lead them to a much bigger fish the number two man in Rome's Gestapo, Eric Priebke. I worked with a woman in Buenos Aires named Dalila Herbst. I hired her as a translator and a fixer and to do research with me. And so we began asking questions. Harry called me and asked me to go down to Badiloche to get in touch with a guy called Juan Maler. We knew that Cops was in Bariloche, and we also knew that Bariloche was a haven for for German migrants. They built this German town in the Andes. Bariloche is essentially an Austrian-German alpine resort in Argentina. For many Germans and Austrians, Bariloche was a real home from home. The lakes were there, the mountains were there, the Germans were there, and a lot of them were Nazis. Reinhard Kops and various other SS men settled in Bariloche for these, these Austrian and German people, they felt like they were in Bavaria or in the Alps somewhere. They lived very openly, they went to the opera, they went to the cafes, they had their restaurants. For them, it was like a home away from home. 
there were probably some covert toasts to Hitler's birthday there. I don't think it was an out-and-out -out sort of Fourth Reich, but I think certainly it was a place where a lot of former Nazis lived. In Bariloche, I was quite uh, afraid of asking who he was. I knew that he had a small hotel, and I called there and said if I could talk to Mr. Juan Maler. And they said he rented this hotel to us, and they wouldn't give any sort of information. And then I began to try to see where I could get this guy. So I phoned his house. And a German woman told me, we don't know when he's coming back. So I said, well, this is going to be a hard work. I called Harry and said, we don't know when he's coming back. After the war, Captain Reinhard Kops fled to Argentina, but not before helping thousands of his fellow Nazis escape the Allies. Reinhard Kops was the spy. He was the man going around handing out landing permits to Argentina to his fellow Nazis. The rat line became the term used by the Nazis who were, you know, running off the sinking ship of the Third Reich, seeking safety. The rat line ran from Germany into either Austria or Switzerland, from there to Italy, where they boarded ships to come to South America. From his office in Rome, cops handled thousands of Nazis on the run. Before long, he orchestrated his own escape to Bariloche, Argentina. So I'm in contact with Dalila a lot. Uh, she stayed in Bariloche while I had returned to the US for a time. I remember asking Dalila to check names out all the time, you know, with the local community and so forth. I was on my own there and absolutely bored. So I went down and asked somebody at the hotel if it, they could give me a list of books just to read and know the story of Bariloche. And between those books were one called The Painter of the Argentine Switzerland. Maybe the book, A Local History, can shed light on the Nazi fugitives who've made this area home. I went to the most important bookstore in Bariloche. I asked the man and he said, it disappeared. So I went to several bookstores that night, and it was exactly the same answer. The next morning, it was a beautiful day. So I went down walking, and there was a little kiosk. And there it was. I couldn't believe that. And I found at the beginning the story of cops. And three pages later, there was a story of a man called Eric Pripke. It was very shocking for me. Kripke had been one of the most important Gestapo officers in Rome during the war. From all reports, he was very, very good at hunting down enemies of the state in Italy. And he had a certain brutality and efficiency about him. Kripke had wide contacts with the Italian fascist, you know, network in Italy, with priests in the Catholic Church. When the Third Reich collapsed in 1945, Eric Kripke went on the run. So Pripka knew he had to leave Italy. There was an active network of priests who were working, helping Nazis escape. The system for acquiring false documents was already in place. In 1948, following the same rat line as Reinhard Kops, Eric Pripka and his family escaped to Buenos Aires. For 50 years, he has eluded justice, 
But now, a team of journalists has stumbled onto his trail. Every day, we're on the phone talking about names, names, names. And uh, finally, Dalila said to me, I think you might be interested in a guy named Eric Pribke. And I said, I, is that name on our list? She said, no, that name's not on our list. But I, I found his name in a bookstore. And I don't know if it's true, but this thesis talks about him being involved in some massacre in Europe. At first, I was a little skeptical. But after the second or third conversation we had on this, I thought, you know what, this, this sounds really promising. Uh, but is the guy alive? And she said, I don't know. And I said, well, find a phone book. So I went and wanted to see if I could get his, uh, his telephone number. And I just got, you know, the, a directory. And sure enough, I brought the phone book home because in the phone book, she found him under his own name. It was his name, Eric Pribke, his address, and his phone number. Eric Pribke, except he had made one change. Instead of the H at the end of Eric, he was listed as E-R-I-C-O, Eriko Pribke. It had to be the same guy. So I called, and a German woman again got me on the phone and said, hold on a second. And when he came to the phone and said, hello, I got afraid and hanged. I couldn't, you know, react. He was alive and perhaps even a war criminal living in hiding deep in the Andes in this small German town. It really was a heart-stopping moment. The ABC News team now hopes to expose not one, but two Nazis. Well, we knew we were going to do a large story. We had to do a total workup of research on Eric Pribke, just to see if indeed this man was a war criminal. Now, Argentina had admitted a huge number of Nazis after World War II. The exact number no one knows to this date. Producer Harry Phillips returns to Veraloce. To stay under the radar, his team needs a cover story. Dalila Herbst came in as a small businesswoman from Buenos Aires who was interested in perhaps moving to Bariloche and looking at business prospects. I was obviously going to be a, a, an American or a Canadian tourist. That's the only thing I could do and pull off. And I went out as a guy who was in town to do some fly fishing. They focus first on tracking down Reinhard Kops. Ultimately, I want to prove that Juan Mahler is Reinhard Kops. So I went to his house, and I just kind of surveyed the area myself. I did not knock on the door. I wanted to just watch him, but I didn't see him. After a few days in Bariloche, it became apparent to me that I might not see Juan Mahler. He hadn't come out of his house if he was in there. He hadn't gone to his business. I didn't know for sure if he was in town. Phillips worries Priebke may have left town as well. He digs deeper into his past. We had to find out if the allegations against Pribke were true. So we had to do a lot of research to, about his past in Nazi Germany. We were shocked with the results. We discovered records that showed that he was part of one of the worst atrocities, perhaps the worst atrocity that occurred in the country of Italy during the war. I thought, oh my god, this guy is right up there with some of the worst Nazi war criminals. By 1944, Priebke was the Gestapo's second in command in Rome. As the war was going very much against the Germans, there was increasing partisan activity. And one day in the spring of 44, 33 German soldiers were blown up by a partisan bomb. They decided to kill 10 Italians for every Nazi who died, so that's 330 uh, compared with 33 of, of the Nazis who were killed. They had 24 hours to find the, the required number of people. And the Gestapo turn up and take away 335 people to be executed. They should have had 330, they got 335. They rounded up five more than they should have. Some of them were Jewish, some of them were children, some of them were very old men. Some of them were Julius Bicicchino's relatives. 
when the German people came um, in the night, a trunk stopped in front of this house of my grandparents. And we see, in this night, there were 18 persons, and they putting them away. Her grandfather, his sons, and his son's sons, three generations are arrested. They were driven up to the Argentine caves. Eric Prebke was the guy standing outside the caves, checking the names off one by one. They were led into these caves by SS men um, with their hands tied behind their backs in, in groups of five. The killing began at 3.30 p.m. These victims would be lined up, and the SS officer would shoot them with one shot in the back of the neck, and the five would fall forward. They asked to kneel, um, putting the, the head down. He killed him, only one shot. Can you imagine inside this dark pit, bodies piling up, you know, the screams of men? It, it is horrible. Then five more would come right behind them, and they will fall forward. Priebke was there with his roster. However, he did more than that. He was one of the first to set an example by killing two of the individuals who were killed in that massacre. It was the most savage, vile reprisal. And we had been working on this story for a couple of months now. We knew that we were at the point where we really had to get shooting. We were talking about Pribka and how we were going to pull this off. We were hoping that we could possibly confront a couple of Nazis in a German town in the Andes, where war criminals had been living for 50 years. We want to see what he's doing today and to see what his life was like in hiding. Dalila Herbst must trick the former Gestapo man into meeting her. I have to go to my room and call him from my room, alone. I can't be with other people to call him. Dalila Herbst concocted a, a story about herself being interested in opening up a delicatessen in Bariloche. By coincidence, he had apparently had some business like that. And I told him that uh, I had a friend who lived in Bariloche, and that my friend told me that he was a very intelligent businessman. I had to think about something nice to tell him. So he agreed to meet with her. On March 28, 1994, Dalila arrives at a cafe in Bariloche to meet the man they think is a Nazi war criminal. And the goal was to check if Pripke was Eric Pripke. We brought a cameraman down to Argentina, and we began to do surveillance of Pripke. We wanted to get as much video of this guy today as possible. We had a camera that was a full-size videotape camera, and it was something that could not be concealed very easily. We had to take a bit of a gamble and expose ourselves a little bit. We were afraid that something might happen. Posing as a businesswoman, an ABC News researcher waits for the man she believes to be a war criminal. We found a location in downtown Bariloche, across the street from a restaurant where Dalila Herbst set up a meeting with Pripke. I had to take a coffee alone with Pripke, and I had to check that Pripke was Pripke. She was presenting herself as a possible investor in a business in, uh, in Bariloche. It was not easy because uh, they told me where I had to sit and where he had to sit. Our cameras were across the street. We were in a kind of a stairwell, and we were one floor above the street. I remember worrying that Pribke would see us. He looked like the most sweet and nice 
grandfather with his blue eyes and innocent look. And I began talking about war. And then I said, uh, you know, my grandfather was born in Berlin. And his face changed. Berlin, he said. I'm from Berlin. I said, what a coincidence. And then I asked him, did you have to kill somebody in the war? And he said, no, because I was an officer in the German embassy in Rome. My coffee cup, you know, just, it was, you know, just running the coffee all over the, what a moment. I am an Argentine Jew. What I felt in front of that man, it was hate. I wanted to run away from that place. But you know, I had to stay because I was working. <laughs> I thought, I'm looking at a Nazi war criminal. This is incredible. This man's been living in hiding, a free man for 50 years after murdering 335 innocent civilians in Rome. When I wanted to say goodbye, I just wanted to shake hands, and I put my arm this way, and he dragged and gave me a kiss in my cheek, and I said goodbye. It was very shocking for me, very shocking for me. We learned about his involvement with the local German school, where he lived, the precise times at which he would go places. Very important strategic information for us to have. And he actually made a point of saying, I am punctual. I come out of the school at 12 o'clock noon exactly and walk home for lunch. I called New York and I said, I think, I don't want to sound too certain of myself at this point, but I think we've got a big fish here. Harry Phillips, the producer, kept briefing me, of course, on his progress. And there came a time when he said, I think we're ready to go down to Argentina. And he laid out what he had. And at that point, we kicked into motion a, a plan to have Sam Donaldson come from Washington to confront Eric Pripka. The ABC team has failed to find Reinhard Kopps. They decide to go ahead with the story anyway, hoping Eric Pripka won't get wind of them and vanish too. I thought it was very important to bring Pripke to justice and to tell the story of this particular Nazi and what he did. Sam Donaldson was the host of a weekend show in Washington. We really only had a couple of days during the week where we could have him in Bariloche or in Argentina at all, for that matter. So we had to get him to Bariloche on a private jet. It was one of those rarefied moments where I'm putting down an American Express card to spend $10,000 for a private jet to fly deep into the Andes. We were very hot for this story. We felt that we were really on the verge of getting something possibly very big. So we came one evening to Bariloche. We stayed at some hotel in the outskirts of town. We instructed the pilots of the aircraft to go undercover. I said, you guys disappear now for 24 hours. Come back and meet us here at 3 p.m. tomorrow. We should be all done by then, and we got to get Sam Donaldson out of here. Harry Phillips had arranged for a van to take us to this hotel on a lake. We stayed there until the next morning when we started out to find the two Germans. We were going to have two camera crews, at least two translators, myself and Sam Donaldson, descending on this quiet little town all at once, people are going to be asking questions. Who are these people? Why are they here? The cameras were in cases, so it wasn't as if we got off an airplane with our cameramen holding their <laughs> cameras on their shoulders. When we checked into the hotel, I instructed the crew to tell everybody that we were wealthy tourists. I had just been there fishing. I was now bringing my friends back. We didn't go out on the town. We didn't say, let's go out on the town and meet a bunch of German citizens here in Argentina and have a beer with them. We wanted to be safe because we were going to do something very provocative. But we also wanted to succeed in what we were doing. And so we had to talk very carefully about what 
our schedule was going to be. We knew that he would come out at noon from his school. And we knew that uh, we had some hours before we would need to be there. So we dedicated the first few hours to surveillance and staking out Juan Mahler's house. Even though we hadn't seen him at all, we thought we'd better spend at least three or four hours with Sam just in case he arrives. And the next morning, we set out first to find Juan Mahler. It was a long shot. At 7 AM, we were out on the street in front of Juan Mahler's house. We couldn't put a camera directly in front of the house without being real obvious. So we had cameras in vans. I'm bleary-eyed because I've been up most of the night. Dalila is exhausted. Sam Donaldson, fortunately, is fresh. And our camera crew is wired, ready for something to happen. I'm just about to say we might not get anything when suddenly the gate opens in front of his house. And out steps Juan Mahler. It is the first time any of the EBC team has set eyes on the former SS officer. And we found him where we thought we could find him. I knew it was him immediately, the first time I'd seen him. And I yelled out to everybody, there he is, he's standing in the street. All of a sudden, a taxi came. He got in it and a taxi took off before we could do anything. So I yelled through the walkie-talkie, Sam, he's coming your way. and we went after his taxi. I was terrified because I had lost sight of him. I was too far behind. We were in a panic. And fortunately, Sam was right behind him as they pulled up to a pharmacy. And Donald said, when I say jump, all of you jump into the street. Sam and his crew leaped out of a vehicle and approached Juan Mahler, who was exiting the pharmacy. I was waiting on the sidewalk. Senor Mahler. I, I'm Sam Donaldson of American Television, ABC News. He introduced myself. He saw the cameras. He knew I was from American Television, and he knew that he was being videotaped. He looked like a rat who'd been caught with the cameras on all sides. Yes, but what do you know? What do you want? Well, is, is your name Reinhard Kops? Excuse me, but I have no time for such a Sam was asking him, are you also Raynard Copps? And Juan Mahler said, no, I am not. So Harry Phillips took out a photo where you could see Copps dressed up as a Nazi. Oh. This is not a uh, photo stat of your membership in the Nazi party. No, never. I'd been a member of a... I kept pressing him uh, on this, and I had his picture, and I had other identifying marks from him as Reinhardt Kops, who looked like the same guy. You are Reinhardt Kops? No, no. No? No. I was, I was in uh, 52. The German embassy here gave me the name. The name of? Of uh, Mahler. Mahler. <laughs> Mahler. And what was your name before Mahler? Uh, Kops. Kops. Your name was Kops. Yeah. No, is not. He was. We got him to admit that he's Reinhard Kops. Second thing was, Sam now had to ask him, did you help Nazis leave Rome? I pressed him on what he had done. Have you ever heard of the rat line? Something called the rat line? No, no, no. And after a little bit of questioning, he admitted that too. I know now that it was something like that. But in those times, I did not know. Now I guess he must have thought, I've got to deflect this interest in me. It was a real shock what he said next. I was not in, in Yugoslavia, Albania, in the SS. Ambushed on the street by ABC News, former SS officer Reinhard Kops is growing desperate. There's a lot of people here still Nazi. A lot, I tell you. Who are they? He pulled me up the street as if to whisper to me. But I still had a microphone. I thought, oh, wow, I don't know what he's going to say, but it's going to be very interesting. And he whispered in Sam's ear. His name is Pripke, P-R-E, Erich Pripke. He was nervous. He wanted out of there. He wanted to deflect attention. And so he decided to give up Eric Pripke. It was priceless. We were giddy is the best word to describe it. 
It would be hours before they could confront Priebke at the German school. How quickly could word spread? You know, you have to realize this Nazi community in Argentina was full of rivalries and hatred. There had already been the case of Adolf Eichmann, who was kidnapped in 1960. There was also lots of rumors that went around the Nazi community in Argentina that Eichmann had been betrayed by one of, these fe one of his fellow Nazis as well. So it's a community where everybody was very suspicious of each other, and they all lived in fear that they would be arrested or kidnapped. Who knows if these individuals are vindictive or whether they want to stop us or whether they feel that, you know, that we have just gotten something that could cause Reinhardt cops to be arrested and thrown in jail. But we only had half of our work done, and we were now planning for the home run. Eric Pribke, he was our next person to go to. The Argentine case massacre is an incredibly important fixture on the sort of Italian cultural historical landscape. To hide their crimes, the Nazis used explosives to seal off the caves and entomb their victims. It was only after Rome's liberation that the true horror of the massacre came to light. The caves were opened later that year, and there's a lot of very gruesome uh, photography taken and a lot of uh, testimony from the archaeologists and scientists who were there who helped dig it up. It is totally emblematic of Nazi brutality. In June 1944, the Allies entered Rome. Priebke fled north to the Italian Alps. One day, there's a knock on the door, and the Americans have come to arrest him. They're rounding people up. Priebke openly admitted to the Ardetan case massacre his participation. He felt it was a legitimate act of war. Following orders, it was reprisal. Priebke spent 18 months in a number of prisoner of war camps. He decides, after a period of time, well, I'm going to escape. So one night, he decides that the way to get out, the weakest part of this camp, is the wire. And uh, so he manages to cut his way out the wire with two accomplices. Priebke knows that he can't just sort of stay on the run all the time. The best way to secure a happy future for himself and his family is to emigrate. But Priebke's future is no longer secure. Four hours after confronting Reinhardt cops, the ABC News team stakes out the school run by the former Gestapo captain. Dalila had done great work telling us about his daily movements. His schedule was so set that you could set your clock to it. We knew where he was. He was at the school, at the Primo Caprara school. Eric Pripke was supposed to be there that morning helping with school children, helping in the classroom. Dalila was insistent he will come out of that building at exactly 12.01. He will, he will be punctual. On two corners, we had a van with a camera in them. We had four walkie-talkies. We were all in communication. But for some reason, his car was parked outside the school. So now we knew that perhaps he would get into his car and drive somewhere, meaning that we would have a very small window opportunity to catch him. We weren't ready for the fact that his car was parked outside the school. The tension is ratcheted up. And then at precisely 12.01, he steps out of the school. Go, 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 go. All the doors fly open, and we converge on him, fearful that he's going to jump into his car and drive away. I approached him. Again, I identified myself. American television. Senator Prepke, Sam Donaldson of American television. Sam is running across the street yelling, Senor Prepke. And I'm having a heart attack because I'm thinking, speak English, please. Don't, don't invite him to speak a foreign language. Sam Donaldson said, Eric Pripke. And he turned around and smiled. Yes. Your yes. Can we talk to you about what you did during World War II? I had no idea what he would say. Finally, ABC News anchor Sam Donaldson is face to face with fugitive Nazi war criminal Eric Priebke. I've interviewed a lot of people who have committed crimes, and uh, they usually run when they see someone like me. He clearly is not intimidated by us in any way. Made no sense. 
Here's a man that's committed terrible crimes. Why does he want to talk <laughs> to a reporter? You were in the Gestapo in 1944, were you not? In Rome? Yes, in Rome, yes. Yes, I am Eric Pribke. Yes, I was in Rome. You know, the, the communists blow up the, uh, a group of our uh, German soldiers. Yes. For every German soldier, 10, ten Italians had to die. He admitted to just about everything that he did. But why did you shoot them? They had not done anything. Yes. You know, that was our order. Donaldson is a man who wouldn't leave you a second without asking things. He keeps asking and asking and asking. But orders are not an excuse. Oh, well, at this time, order was an order, you man, you see? And, and he was getting more and more agitated. He said, we didn't want to do it. I didn't want to do it, but I had to. You were just following orders? Yes, of course, yes, yes. But I didn't shot anybody. He actually denied that he had shot anyone personally. But we had papers from a British prisoner of war camp where he had admitted shooting two people. We had his confession. You were there when they were shot, the civilians. I saw them, uh, yes, the first ones, yes, I saw them, yes. And you carried it out? I had to carry it out, yes. And civilians died? Civilians died, yes. When Sam raised the idea that perhaps he was a war criminal, he was indignant. Uh, he said, you live in this time, but we did live in 1933. In a sense, that. I asked him whether old men should pay for the crimes they commit when they're young. You know, that was not a crime, that was a... Shooting Italian. civilians in time of war is against all international yes, conventions. today, but not in this time. I'm sure Dalila was enraged. I felt proud because I said, at least one. I got one. Reporters are not supposed to be uh, emotional on in, in, in a story. We, we're trying to get the facts and all of this. But I did become emotional uh, by this time. How do you feel about the fact that six million Jews were executed, killed? Yeah, no, I feel very sorry about it. I'm very, very sorry. But you did it. Many young men do things when they are old men like me now, they're very sorry about it. And finally, I said to him, many people think you should be executed for your crimes. And at that point, you could see a bell ringing in his head. You know, is this a good idea, talking to this idiot? You came over me, right, for I accepted. Not a nice man as you did it. You are not a gentleman. And he slams the door and drives away. It was a high like you only experience once in your career. We got on a phone, and the reaction from New York is, oh my god, this sounds amazing. So I said to Harry, I think we better get out of town as quickly as we can. The worry that I had was that someone would realize that it would be advantageous to get hold of that videotape and not let it leave Bariloche. That was my worry. ABC News have captured Nazi war criminals Reinhard Kops and Eric Priebke on tape. It is a huge story. They can't risk losing it. We knew that we had to get Sam out of town. And so within two hours of the confrontation with Pripka, we called the pilots who were hiding in Bariloche. By the time Sam got there, they were just about ready to go, and he left very quickly. It's safe to say within six hours of that encounter, those tapes were airborne for the United States. It was better than the best luck I ever could imagine. This is one of those moments where you just say everything went absolutely right. We knew we had a great story. That's all we knew initially. Good evening. Tonight, we're going to tell the story of how thousands of suspected Nazi war criminals escaped justice. When we put this story in the air, what might happen to Eric Pripke was going to be the next story. The broadcast airs six weeks after the 50th anniversary of the Ardiatayan Cave Massacre. The reaction in Argentina was an explosion of media. In Italy, the same thing happened because the Italians actually believed that all of the perpetrators of that massacre in Rome in 1944 were either dead or had been convicted. Within days of the broadcast, Pripka is arrested. Cops was hounded to the point where he vanished and, and fled the country, apparently went to Chile. And with Pripka in custody, the media went crazy with pictures and stories and full-page headlines. It's perhaps the one 
story that I'm proudest of from the standpoint of making a difference that, that I think counts. Italy demands that Pripka be sent back to Rome. There was a year and a half tussle in the Argentine courts, but he finally was extradited to Italy to stand trial. Giulio Spizzichino, who campaigned for his extradition, attends the trial. He never looked at me, never, because I was always the first person who speak about to him. Priebke's brought to Rome, where he faces a, a military tribunal. The tribunal finds him guilty of doing what he did, but they have to set him free because he was acting under orders, that old excuse. Huge outrage that he's been set free. I mean, there's almost a riot outside the courtroom, and so he's immediately rearrested. He appeals the verdict twice and is finally sentenced to life. When you're over a certain age in Italy, you can't actually be sent to prison. He is now currently serving his sentence in an apartment in the center of Rome. It made me very happy, and that was all. I know it's difficult, but uh, for me, it's impossible to forgive, to forgive, to forget. It was a validation of, of the highest order, you know, to think that governments were taking action to prosecute this man based on our work. Human nature has not yet come to the point, it seems to me, where we can all just say, forget it. These kind of atrocities will not occur again. But one way to try to prevent them is tell the story of how people who may have started out as ordinary human beings became murderers. <laughs>